Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm Logan, and while we've talked a lot about in-home streaming here on our channel, or the idea of taking content like movies and TV shows and putting them on a server for streaming within your local network, there's usually one big problem with these solutions that can make setting up for yourself inaccessible to many people. And that is the cost of putting together all of the components you need in order to make this work. Once you consider a dedicated NAS and some hard drives, you could very easily be sinking thousands of dollars into the setup before you even get a chance to watch your first movie. But today I want to talk about an alternative to expensive network attached storage and RAID arrays because I bet for a lot of you out there you could get an identical experience with a tiny little computer board like this and some inexpensive solid state storage along with just a little bit of setup. Best part is you can buy it all brand new, like literally right now on Amazon, for around 150 bucks. So if you want to do this for yourself just like we did, well, here's what you're going to need. The reason this is possible in the first place is because of a little piece of gear called the Libre computer board. And for those of you familiar with the world of single board computers, this probably looks a lot like a Raspberry Pi. Basically, this is going to be the brains of our in-home streaming operation. The model I have here is the $50 Renegade board, and this thing is essentially just a computer in the size of a credit card. And for 50 bucks, it offers a really solid base for putting together a home server. For example, this board here has 4 gigabytes of DDR4 memory a quad-core ARM processor, gigabit ethernet, and a single USB 3 port. And this means we basically get everything we could possibly ask for. High-speed networking, high-speed interface for adding storage, and enough processing power to comfortably host a file server or stream movies and TV shows over something like Jellyfin. And of course, to do that, we'll need just a couple of other components to get the board up and running. Basically, any USB 3 storage should work perfectly fine here, and you can get plenty of cheap USB hard drives right off Amazon that would work perfectly for this purpose. One last thing you're going to need is a micro SD card to boot the computer board, and those can be had for really cheap nowadays. Just make sure you get at least a 16 gigabyte class 10 micro SD card so you'll have enough space to install the operating system on the board. And that's where we get into the setup. Right now, the computer board is just a dumb circuit board, and if you plug it into a phone charger, all it's going to do is light up. Nothing is going to actually happen. So that's why you need to flash an operating system onto our SD card. To do that, we'll be using the Raspbian 11 operating system image from Libre Computer, which I'll leave down in a link in the description. This will give you a compressed file, so if you don't have the software for that already, take a moment to go to 7zip.org and download the latest version of 7zip for Windows, get that installed, and now you'll be able to open that downloaded file from within 7zip and extract the IMG file from inside. If you're on a Mac, you should be able to do the same thing by getting the unarchiver from the App Store. Now that we have our IMG file, we'll need a piece of software like the Raspberry Pi Imager, which is available on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, to copy the contents of this image file onto our SD card. We'll leave a link to that down in the description as well, so just download it, install, and once you see the main app window, click the Choose OS button. In the list that appears, scroll down until you see the Use Custom option. That'll open a window, and go ahead and select that IMG file that you extracted earlier. At this point, put your micro SD card into your computer and select that as your target drive for flashing. Hit the flash button, wait a little while, and you should end up with an SD card which you can then remove from your computer and put into the server board. At this point, we're ready to go ahead and start getting some of our other software up and running, so you're going to want to get yourself a monitor, a keyboard, and an Ethernet network connection for the server board. If you plug in a micro USB cable for power, the board should eventually boot and give you a prompt to enter a username, so go ahead and do that. You'll then be asked to type in a password and then verify it. Once that's done, you'll be sitting at a regular login prompt just like this. Just type in your username and password and you'll be able to log in. At this point, we're going to actually install the software that allows us to interact with the server board over the network, which is called Casa OS. And thankfully, this is also really simple. You'll only need to type in one command, which I'll put on the screen right here. Once you do that, Casa OS will automatically start detecting information about your board and download all the extra files it needs to run. If you run into an error regarding Docker, which I did, it'll tell you what command you can run to fix that problem. And with any luck, you can run the first command again, and Casa OS should install properly. 
If all goes well, you should see a few lines listed like this, giving you a URL that you can use to access Casa OS from a web browser. So now you can switch over to a regular desktop computer and continue the setup from there. Type that IP address into the URL bar and you'll see a nice welcome screen for Casa OS, which you can click through to create your user account. And now you'll see the home screen for Casa OS, which you can think of kind of like the web UI you'd see with Synology NASes, for example. At this point, you can head into the file section and click on the entry for your removable drive. And here we're going to make a new folder for storing all of our shared media. I'll be calling mine Jellyfin Media, and we're going to go ahead and share this folder. That way it'll be accessible throughout our network, and it would be really easy to add as an SMB share from a Zadoo media player, for example. And inside of that, you can make folders for things like storing movies, TV shows, music, and everything like that. At this point, if you had some movies on your drive already, all you'd have to do is share the folder holding those movies, and as a do, would be able to pick those up right away. So you're basically done with the setup here. If you don't have anything on your drive yet, all you have to do is eject the drive using the little eject button here, bring it over to your computer, and copy any of your own content to the drive. One last thing we'll do here is install and configure Jellyfin so it can see our USB drive, and this is also a really easy process thanks to Casa OS. All you have to do is head into the Casa OS App Store, look for Jellyfin, hit install, and wait for that to do its thing. Once that's done, hover over its tile in the home screen, click the three dot menu that appears, and go to settings. In the settings window, go ahead and scroll down, and in the section for volumes, you'll want to add a new entry. This is where you'll be linking the real USB hard drive to a mount point that Jellyfin has access to and can read from. So in the left box, click the Browse button, go into the Media folder right here, followed by whatever entry shows for your drive, followed by the Jellyfin Media folder you made earlier. Then hit Select, and in the right-hand side box, type in something that you can simply remember, like forward slash USB underscore HDD, for example. Now if you go ahead and open Jellyfin, you should be able to set it up like normal. You can add libraries, and whenever you add a folder, just select that USB underscore HDD link that you made earlier. With that, your server is now sharing whatever movies you keep in your media folder across both an SMB share and a nice little Jellyfin server. One last change that I highly recommend making is going into the Jellyfin dashboard. Entering users, go into your main user, Logan in my case, and scroll down until you see options for playback permissions. Here you should disable the options to allow video and audio playback that requires transcoding, and also disable the option that allows video playback that requires conversion. This will break playback in the browser, so you won't be able to watch Jellyfin movies from within Google Chrome, for example, but it will ensure that the server won't sit and hang if it gets asked to convert any video, which can cause massive issues. Instead, the server will just give a playback error, which is perfectly fine since this won't affect playback on things like NVIDIA Shield. And that's pretty much it. You can copy any kind of media over to this thing, and it'll allow you to stream that content over the network to a variety of different clients, like Zadoo, NVIDIA Shield, Apple TV, whatever you might have with the right software. Now, a couple of things that I should note with this solution. First and foremost, you're going to be missing out on some really nice features, like the ability to protect your data in a RAID array, for example. For a media server, I don't see this as a huge problem, since if your hard drive or SSD dies, you just have to take the time to rip all of your media again, but that can be a really big time sink. And if you want to use this as a general purpose network attached storage solution, you probably want to look into something that has data protection built in anyway. So if you want a RAID setup, this probably isn't the best place to start. And if you need a system that supports transcoding, for example, if you want to watch on older devices, you can pretty much forget this setup entirely, since the low-powered ARM chip on the Libre computer board, while being very efficient, is not powerful enough to do any kind of transcoding. Of course, for some folks, this is also just a pretty involved process. This isn't a system that you can just buy on Amazon and hook up to get working, so I would probably say you should only approach this if you're comfortable getting your hands dirty and you want to learn about things like setting up Linux, for example. And if something goes wrong here, well, you are your technical support. But I still think this is a really cool example of just how far you can get with open software and affordable hardware, and honestly, I'm really happy with the way it turned out. If you want to look into setting up something like this for your own little home media server, then I'll be sure to leave links to Amazon for all the parts we used. 
And with all that said, I think it's just about time to wrap up this video. So if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them down in the comments section below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss any of our future content. And as always, have an awesome day.